Hi everyone. Um, so this is just a, a bit of an overview of the talk that I'm going to be giving to the friends of SCOMA and Skokum Group that sadly you yourselves will not be joining, which is why I'm here giving you a sort of pre-recorded version of this talk, um, although I'm really looking forward to seeing those that can make it later this month in February for the gathering uh, down in Chepstow. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been uh, asked to give this talk a bit of an overview of, sort of some of my experiences um, on unessentially Bardsey Island, uh, growing up on this wonderful Welsh island that hopefully some of you will have been to. But if you haven't, this is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a whirlwind tour, really, of this incredibly special place. A bit about my relationship to it, and very much um, around the ecology and the wildlife of the island as well. So just a brief bit of background, my, uh, my name is Ben Porter. Um, I am an ecologist and wildlife photographer, a um, bit of an all-round nature nerd and enthusiast, to be honest, anything from moths uh, through to mammals, birds, and the marine realm, and Arctic alpine plants, any, anything really. I um, do quite a lot of seabird research. Um, I'm really passionate in science communication. I'm currently working for a joint sort of partnership project, uh, both for the RSPB Woodland Trust um, and other local organisations in Mid Wales on a sort of landscape scale habitat restoration project, trying to work with lots of different local landowners, farmers, community groups um, towards a sort of joined up way of uh, restoring habitats and connecting up ecosystems in this area of Wales. So. For this talk, um, I'm going to be focusing on essentially, and my personal interest in the natural world and ecology has come from um, a sort of, it's been fostered by an upbringing on this amazing island uh, off Wales. This is a picture uh, standing on the side of the mountain there, looking out over the south end, the Bardsey Lighthouse and the, the dark skies above. And I guess in many ways it's hard not to be inspired by the natural world and wildlife when you're in a place like this, which I'm sure, you know, probably why many of you are brought together around your shared love for Skoma and Skokum as well. They're incredibly special places, these Welsh islands and Bardsey none the more so. Um, so in essentially itself, uh, that's the Welsh name, which means sort of island in the tides, which is very appropriate considering its place in one of the most notorious uh, areas of tidal currents in Wales, if not the UK. So Bardsey Island sits off the Slim Peninsula here in sort of northwest Wales, uh, a couple of miles out. And it's not very big, you know, a couple of kilometres long by a kilometre and a half wide. And it's got quite a, a sort of varied topography, really, quite a varied landscape geologically that supports a plethora of different habitats and species which make it so special. And it's very different um, uh, in terms of the topography to a lot of the southern islands, um, in terms of the um, the way that the island sits, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of go into that a little bit more around the sort of ecological side of things shortly, but this just gives you a bit of an overview. And just as a way of a, a bit of background on the island um, before delving into the ecological realm more, uh, more in depth, um, Barty's had a, a really long sort of history of, of habitation, really, uh, going back, you know, Neolithic artefacts have been found and uh, evidence of um, you know, occupation during the Bronze Age by Roman era, Viking longhouses, um, all the way through to sort of Celtic Christianity and there's a ruin of a 13th century abbey there, Celtic crosses. Um, you know, the whole island is just layered with um, all sorts of different archaeologically interesting features from across the ages. So it has been a place of, um, you know, habitation through those times. Um, and it was, you know, an incredibly important place of pilgrimage um, for those sort of seeking, um, you know, sort of being closer to heaven, especially for the sort of place of burial. So there's about 20,000 saints said to be buried on the island. Um, and many did have pilgrimage to the island and wanted to be buried there to be closer to heaven and it was said you know it's said for for entity that it's uh, you know equivalent of uh, you know three trips to Bardi is equivalent of one to rome it's that sort of significant in terms of its historical um yeah sort of historical artifacts there 
Um, and more recent times, I guess, it, uh, it supported uh, a sort of thriving community, really, of 100, up to 150 people in the sort of 19th century in particular. And these were subsisting off sort of farming on the island, arable crops, so there's horses there, all manner of different products, and very much interlinked with fishing offshore in the sort of uh, low-level, sustainable sort of lobster fishing and fish itself. Um, uh, the lobster fishing using willow um, sort of from the withy beds on the island, so making creels. Um, and a lot of these goods were traded with, you know, areas, I Ireland, Liverpool, offshore, um, by yeah, commuting over to these areas to trade trade the goods and bring back all sorts of different goodies, which doesn't feel too dissimilar to when we were living there. Um, but, um, you know, that's the amount of people that are supporting at that point, um, which is, you know, much reduced in the current times with about 11 sort of, part-time residents really only two people lived there full-time through the whole of the year and there were four four of us when we were living there as a family um, uh, alone for four months of the year in the winter um, so yeah it's sort of uh, it's been a been a place of um, real interest for people through the ages and there's a lot of layers to the island in terms of those that have come there and the interests um, of those uh, that either live there or visit, you know, you've got your, your sort of livelihoods. It's very much a working island, so the, the farming is very much focused on conservation, but it is still a working farm there. Um, and you've got the fish here, you know, the fishing still going on offshore, mainly for lobsters. And um, you've got history and archaeological elements, as I said, said before. Um, and a lot of people still come there with interests, you know, sort of connected to that. Uh, and, and the spirituality as well, you know, a lot of people come as pilgrimage to the island and seeking quietude and solitude in these sort of really special places. Um, more recently, it's uh, acquired sort of dark sky sanctuary status, um, which is one of the highest levels of uh, dark skies reserve status you can be awarded. Um, uh, it's only the it's the only one of sanctuary status in 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 UK at the moment, uh, which is super exciting. Um, then you've got sort of visitor and recreational element. You know, it's a massive part of it, both the day visitors and those that come to stay for periods of a week, two weeks, three weeks through the summertime. Um, there's a real sort of transient community that all come together connected by the island. Um, and, um, and that's a big part of the, the sort of, I guess, the livelihood for those connected to the island, the sort of the bird observatory and the Bardsey Island Trust that run the houses and the boatmen. You know, the sort of visitor element is a massive part of all of that being able to 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 run really um, and of course um, above and below all of that you have wildlife and the conservation on the island and that uh, is what I'll be featuring most during this talk because it's a particular interest to me I mean here's, here's a few flavors of some of the species you get here you know it's a it's an incredibly diverse place for everything from the marine realm which is flourishing with all sorts of different species kelp forests rissos dolphins um, bottlenose dolphins gray seal colonies all the way through to the insect life on the island the seabirds the chuffs the migratory bird life the resident breeding birds you know all manner of different things um, that make it just such an exciting and inspiring place to be really um, and I mentioned it a little bit before, just to give a brief overview of the sort of topography of the island. As you can see here, you've got this quite large lump on the left-hand side, or the east-hand side of the island, which is Bardsey Mountain. And that slopes off steeply to the sort of cliffs where you have all the seabird colonies on the east side there. And on the west side, it slopes away to much lower-lying sort of land, which includes wetland habitats, it includes more productive fields that were used as arable, and more recently hay fields, and grazing land for the sheep. And then you've got the west uh, and south end, which has a sort of low rocky shore and your really important sort of maritime cliff uh, sort of wildflower communities. Uh, it's quite a low lying rocky shore compared to the sort of cliffs that surround, sort of fortify the islands of Skoma and Skokum. So it's quite different in that respect. You don't have that ring of cliffs with all the seabirds sort of breeding on like you do there. And the Manx shearwaters that nest on Bardsey are sort of throughout the whole of the island, really. They're not concentrated in any one place as such. And as a mean of a broad overview of the sort of importance of the island, you know, it's got a whole array of designations, National Nature Reserve, Triple SI, um, it's an SBA, Special Protection Area. It's both a, a sort of terrestrial and a marine special area of conservation. 
And uh, the sort of particular features that it's been designated as those uh, include things like the, the Manx Shearwater Colony, which is pushing on 30,000 pairs now. Uh, that's up from 20,000 just maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So it's really increasing, which is really interesting. Um, the chuff breeding population and non-breeding sort of foraging over winter um, is a super important feature and what a lot of the conservation grazing is targeted towards maintaining habitat for. Um, there's many different habitats and important plant communities, which include sort of maritime heath and the coastal cliff communities of, of wildflowers. Um, and you have particular species like western clover, small adder's tongue, and a, a few nationally scarce bryophytes, which are found on the island as well. And as I mentioned before, in terms of the marine realm, you know, it's got really important sort of nursery ground for Risso's dolphins offshore, uh, which seasonally can be found there in pretty, pretty good numbers, really. Um, and the grey seal colony is ever present, sort of 200 to 300 individuals and maybe 50 to 60 pups every year. So not quite anywhere near as, none, as many as, as Skoma, but still quite significant, really. And some fascinating movements between these islands uh, that connect them, uh, as we've found in more recent years of uh, sort of bio... Um, bio tracking and this is a very small list these are some of the more important features but it doesn't really encapsulate the the pure sort of vibrancy of all the other life and wildlife that's found on the island and that when managed right as well can really flourish there which i'll feature a bit more in a sec um, and wildlife ha has been monitored pretty extensively on the policy since uh, the inception of the bird observatory in 1953, which has served similar purposes as many bird observatories across the UK, and providing really uh, fantastic in-depth insights into the, the lives of all the species found there and the trends over time, and some really interesting studies as well. And that sort of really set the, set the ground really for our later uh, move to the island to actually become full-time residents. And that was after a, a job was advertised in 2007 to become the island uh, managers, the farmers, um, managing all the stock and trying to achieve the sort of balance of conservation, uh, grazing and management there. And now we had, as a family, no experience uh, in farming before this, but because of our love for the place and it would just be this dream come true for all of us to move there. We just went for it, really. I was two months into secondary school at that time. And, uh, yeah, I had to explain to my friends, oh, yeah, I'm moving to a, an island. I'll see you, see you later at some point, I guess. <laughs> no, friends did visit occasionally, but it was quite a big move for us all. Um, and so October 2007, we moved to the island. One week after a red flag blue tail was there, which I sadly missed. Um, and to... to, uh, to you make things even worse. Two weeks after we moved onto the island, I um, had a bit of an accident where I was helping my dad with some fencing work um, in a break from my first day of homeschooling. I managed to get my hand in between the post and a massive sledgehammer that my dad was hammering the post in with and uh, unfortunately crushed my finger pretty badly and was airlifted off later that day um, and yeah, went into general anaesthetic to get it stitched up and yeah, put back together. So it was a bit of a, a rocky entrance, but we uh, we did persist and thankfully uh, weathered out the first winter, which included several periods of not being uh, yeah being without a boat for three weeks at a time. Uh, twice I think we were, you know. So definitely uh, an induction of fire into moving onto the island and living there. But really nice to have that winter period of solitude before the busyness of spring and summer um, began. So in terms of some experiences uh, with island life um, after moving there, the running the island farm and conservation grazing, that was a huge learning curve for us all, uh, my parents uh, especially, because they were heading this up. I was just, I was 11 at the time when we moved to the island, so I was just helping out here and there and absorbing this sort of amazing experience and being able to, you know, help sort of rounding up the sheep, dosing. You know, there's a lot of hard work involved. It really is, you know, pretty full on uh, sort of managing all the stock through the season. Seasons. Um, with the island, we had uh, about 400 sheep, 40 cattle, um, and sometimes uh, the, the lambs would be taken off in the autumn. And sometimes a few of the cattle would be taken off in the autumn, and we'd bring some uh, bring some sheep on in the, in the spring as well, depending on the sort of uh, the levels of grass, which would be massively dependent on the conditions and how severe a winter it would 
it had been as well. Uh, but that's the sort of general amount of, of, of livestock that we were managing on the island. This is an image of uh, the sort of movement of livestock on and off via boat. <laughs> Um, and sort of the journey in learning how to be stewards of the land was, uh, yeah, a really incredible thing, really. Um, uh, for us, we really felt it was a place to, um, you know, really go above and beyond just the sort of statutory uh, requirements of, of meeting the sort of targets for the National Nature Reserve in terms of the conservation management. We really wanted to see the island, you know, flourish and thrive to its uh, greatest extent possible. Um, and that was massively helped by the fact that my mum, as a botanist and ecologist, could pair the sort of farming side um, with all the monitoring and sort of surveys of the plant communities in, in real detail, which she was hired by RSPB to do uh, in the end. Um, so could really see the sort of the subtle changes between habitats and what would be best to do in terms of managing the stock. Um, and generally that would involve um, quite carefully um, Quite carefully planned sort of rotational grazing really so the islands divided into you know hundreds of fields um, and many many different compartments which you can shift the sheep around through at different times of year to really try and benefit the, the habitats when they need it most um, so having you know, sort of hard grazing in some areas in the sort of early spring and then releasing that and keeping grazing off through the spring to allow sort of all manner of different amazing wildflowers to flourish especially on the coastal regions you know sort of with squill and thrift coming out in the spring um, and then in, in some of the fields, having autumn ladies tresses, you know, really just paying careful attention to how best rotate the sort of grazing through these units uh, during the different times of year. Features like the maritime heath would require, you know, sort of quite hard grazing at certain times of year to keep the more rigorous grasses down and allow that really special and scarce habitat to flourish during the rest of the year. Um, so it was a real, you know, real learning curve and the cattle as well. Um, we ended up trying to use these as a bit of a tool to manage the bracken on the mountain in this spring. So moving the cattle up there over the winter and into the early spring so they can trample in the rhizomes of the bracken and really try and hammer that back to benefit the sort of mountain uh, heathland and gorse community, western gorse. And then in the sort of spring and summer, have them down in the wetland habitats and rotate them through these areas to really, you know, keep the rushes slightly um, slightly at bay and allow all the different amazing wetland plants and orchids and ragged robin and flowers to come up. So this real mosaic and patchwork of habitats which is, is possible on the island but through quite careful management really. Um, we had a couple of goats for milking and supplying our milk needs um, which came on and off by boat. Um, didn't enjoy the journey but adapted to island life once they were there. Um, and we paid quite careful attention to worming as the use of chemicals on the island. So we did uh, uh, fecal counts um, by looking at the dung of particularly of the sheep um, to see how many, for instance, nematodes were in a sample. And if it got above a threshold level, you dose the sheep. But very much uh, sort of response to that careful monitoring instead of just a, a blanket sort of dosing of all the animals every month as is sort of uh, standard, uh, which means that you get poo that you know, would be lathered with chemicals and really obviously detrimental for dung beetles and the larvae and the chuffs that depend on them. So being able to limit the amount of chemicals used by just as and when you really have to, little practices like this that actually uh, make quite a big difference um, to a really sort of environmentally friendly sort of land management really. And some of the habitats see, that result from sort of management, we definitely didn't get it right all the time. And it's a huge amount of learning and year to year is massively different depending on the weather conditions. Um, but here's you've got the autumn ladies tresses on the left there. Um, you've got the ling heather flowering on the bottom right image here. And golden hair like one of my favourite uh, species of uh, sort of the non, uh, well, I guess the flora really on the island uh, lower. Yeah, the, this lichen is just fantastic, just lights up on some of the, the rockier mounds on the, on the mountain. And the chuffs are a, a, a superb feature of the island and one of the main reasons for the sort of cons conservation grazing as well, keeping the sort of sward height um, as is sort of best for them and obviously the sort of dung with all the invertebrates that feed within them uh, that really support. We've got about nine uh, breeding pairs of chuffs on the island um, and upwards of 50 overwintering on one of the beaches that feed in amongst the invertebrates on rotting piles of kelp. Um, but just amazing having these over your house every single day in the, the sort of aerobatics and the, 
the way they just play around in the wind, you know, just amazing birds, really, fantastic things. So launching into homeschooling, this is uh, a sort of, I see this as a, a tiered system where you have the sort of, the conventional sort of schooling, which we did attempt to continue. So I was two months into secondary school when we moved there and you know, homeschooling didn't look like this all the time, but definitely at, a peer, at, at, at points it was uh, closely resembled this. Um, and uh, we, uh, yeah, we set about a system of having sort of a, a morning chunk of of school time and then in an afternoon and helping out on the farm and doing all other things sort of in between but uh, having that sort of structure did help and we carried on doing you know sort of GCSEs A levels guided by the sort of the standard curriculum really and my mum set about uh, tasked as, as as head teacher for me and my sister and did a cracking job actually and we registered with the uh, sort of school on the mainland who we would then go and sit our exams with in the spring uh, if the weather allowed for getting off on a boat um, and amazingly we did manage to get all, to all of our exams although it was a great source of um, what's the word trauma for me because usually it would be about May time when all the rarities are turning up and I'd have to go to the mainland for a week to sit all the exams and miss all the the best birds but um, while schooling on the island I would frequently have to uh, duck out of school and go and see some of the rarities that that turned up. We had a little VHF radio system on the island for communication, but usually it was uh, used to communicate where and when scarcities turned up. So I had this on in the uh, in the kitchen as I was uh, schooling and it didn't uh, yeah, it didn't provide the most uh, undistracted environment for doing the school, but some of the amazing rarities that you get up were just too too good to miss. <laughs> so here's a, a small selection. Um, Beautiful species of Kretschmar's bunting on the top left, a citrine wagtail on the top right, pied wheat ear bottom left, and a palacis warbler on the bottom right. Just a tiny sort of selection of some of the, the, the juicier species that turn up. Um, and obviously, getting involved with all other things on the island, uh, there was just so much to sort of explore and, and uh, try you know sort of doing really and uh, I was given a boat whilst I was there and ended up doing a lot of uh, lobster fishing uh, so spending a lot of time rowing around the bays uh, putting out some small lobster pots and selling selling these to visitors um, which helped get some of my first photography gear when I was really getting into photography but also just being out you know on the sea looking at seals hopping into the water and snorkeling amongst the sort of kelp forests and things just being fully immersed in this place it's just absolutely you know, really fond memories and feel incredibly grateful to have had this opportunity. Um, really fantastic. And uh, as a sort of unconventional element of the schooling, uh, I did actually um, do a astronomy as a GCSE uh, taught, my, taught by my dad, which was an option uh, in the curriculum at that point. Um, and really topical with the incredible dark skies um, that are on the island, especially after the lighthouse went to a red LED in 2014, um, which allowed a lot less sort of light pollution on the island um, to, to create, yeah, just amazing skies, which have now been recognized under the, the dark skies uh, sanctuary status. Um, so that's really fantastic. And it was a great GCSE to do whilst in this place. Um, probably one of the biggest elements of what I would consider homeschooling on the island was being immersed um, in the wildlife and monitoring and taken under the wing of Barty Bird and Field Observatory whilst I was there. Um, and this had an uh, enormous effect um, and sort of way of catalyzing my early interest in nature, really. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, Barty. Um, well, bird observatories in general are fantastic places. Uh, been carrying out wildlife monitoring, bird ringing, youth eng engagement increasingly, uh, sort of act as a place of mentoring for younger people getting into wildlife. Um, we have the two in Wales, obviously, one down with the group uh, down Skokum, um, which is fantastic to see, uh, doing such amazing work down there. And Barty has been going since 1953. And being 200 metres down the road um, was an incredible opportunity. And as I said, um, was taken under their wing and 
given a huge amount of mentoring and I've got a lot to thank uh, to the staff uh, and visitors to the Bardsey Bird Observatory uh, for all their help in training me up essentially as you know sort of learning all the species IDs for you know, birds but also moths and insects and everything uh, they gave me a moth trap um, not long after I'd moved to the island and I suddenly became immersed in this incredible new world of just fascinating uh, invertebrate life um, and spent a lot of time ringing at the bird observatory and on the island and got my sea permit within a few years of being there uh, at quite a young age and was able to help out with a lot of the seabird monitoring and doing a lot of census uh, monitoring work in itself um, and then entering this data and the sort of spreadsheets and creating reports and uh, contributing to both the daily blog online and to the annual reports and all these sort of opportunities have been incredibly, you know, whilst being super enjoyable and amazing at the time, they've also been incredibly useful for subsequent sort of work and career in ecology, really. You know, by the time I got to university, the sort of practical element had done more than I'd ever, you know, sort of have, have dreamt, really. So... Um, it was an amazing opportunity to be um, to be able to work with the, the Bird Observatory and um, it's a fantastic place to, to be continuing the youth engagement work and having groups of young people going over every year and you know having a lot of these experiences um, themselves um, which uh, you know often has a, has a massive effect and a massive impression on someone at that age just uh, getting into the natural world. Uh, time there's some of the sort of my favorites uh, this is on sort of Manx Shearwater under the dark and starry night sky on the island in April with the Celtic crosses in the background uh, taken with a fisheye lens and a long exposure to try and capture these these sort of the atmosphere and these elements a small tortoiseshell butterfly on some sheep's bit on the coast uh, on a sunny spring day Uh, sort of underwater habitat so you've got snake locks and enemy um, in amongst the, an amazing diversity of seaweeds and kelp forests where you find some fantastic marine life uh, by snorkeling uh, on a calm <laughs> summer's day uh, this is a wide angle of an oyster catcher on its nest uh, using a remote trigger release uh, sort of springtime with the, the gorse and the background flowering up on the the mountain. Beautiful birds, one of my favourites actually. And then of course the sort of overarching thing of being on a on an island is that your your lives are entirely dictated by the weather. Uh, for us, you know obviously not just the boats day to day and week to week but also uh, things like power you know we were you know totally off grid on a place like an island and we had a, a generator or a sort of diesel powered generator initially but then transitioned towards solar uh, and wind um, and even though it was it was you know really good to start sort of using just renewable energy it's still very limited so you know your ability to use an internet or any appliances was always like oh you know is the sun you know is the sun up is the is, the, is it windy which often it is but still it wasn't a big turbine so you know you really had to uh, adjust your life to the weather which is an incredibly refreshing way to live um, and is really an amazing experience actually um, and I think it's something that's just incredibly deeply connecting to your wider environment when you're on somewhere like an island it really is one of those um, amazing layers to being somewhere like that and I think it's a commonality to, to many islands really I'm sure the same with the Skoma and Skokum um, way of life and of course it does bring its challenges and there are loads of challenges that I haven't really had time to go fully in depth with uh, around you know sort of the farming and uh, being in a small community and the sort of busyness in the summertime and living by the weather you know there's so many different challenges that come up in a place like this but um, because of your the nature of being on an island you've got to be resourceful and pragmatic a lot of the time um, and I think you know being able to to live in that way is is an incredibly rich and even though it may be a sort of a simpler and without luxuries at times um, it's amazingly rewarding um, and an amazing experience uh, growing up in a place like this um, one of my favorites across the winter time was just witnessing the sort of immense storms rolling in from the southwest um, 
I'm a real special quality to being on the island when it's just the four of you for four or five months, you know, a real, um, real place to be during those sort of periods. Um, this is a herring gull just flying in front of uh, a pretty immense wave breaking on the, on the cliffs of the east side. And so that's a very brief overview of life on the island. Um, I hope it gave you a bit of a flavour to, to Bardsey and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, feature every, uh, every nugget and every uh, image and element of wildlife. I could definitely speak for hours about Bardsey but unfortunately uh, with only half an hour that's about as much as I can manage to squeeze in. Um, but if you do have any questions um, and if you would like to get involved you know definitely recommend coming and staying on Bardsey. You can stay in the trust houses, the Bardsey Island trust houses for periods of a week or two weeks or you can stay at the Bird Observatory which is more of a sort of hostel style. Get in touch. Um, and let me know if you do have any questions specifically about the island or its ecology or anything really. Um, uh, I've been, yeah, it's great to have the opportunity to speak to you all and I hope you uh, enjoy the talk. Um, and if you did want to find uh, a few more images or follow some of my current work, um, you can check out the website there, uh, benporterwildlife.co.uk uh, or find me on Instagram at benwildimages. Um, and this is a beautiful, fluffy Manx Shearwater chick, as I'm, all, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, but yes, I hope you enjoyed that uh, talk. I'm sorry you wouldn't uh, be able to make it in person later this month. Um, and I hope I can see you over on Bardsey or down on one of the southern islands at some point. Uh, so thank you very much and take care.